this beautiful Lord on your song sheet.
Well, good morning, River Church. Pastor Mark with you. Thanks for joining us here on the River's online worship experience. So glad you're with us. Hey, uh, there should be a number like right here somewhere. If you're brand new with us, text that number right there. Text it, fill out the form. And we'd love to connect with you. We'd love to send you a free t-shirt. They're really cool, honestly. You'll like it. Uh, we got three different colors now of it. Good time. So do that right there. That number right there. Do that, text it fill out the form, we're all good. Hey, we are uh, got a lot going on here at the river. Hey, we're in the middle of summer and uh, we're excited. We have our Boom Sports and Arts Camp that's coming up, which is full. You know, you could do us a huge favor by praying for that, volunteering for that. Uh, we would love to have you help out during that week in any way that you can. And then I wanna let you know of something that's coming up. On Friday night, August 13th, our movie on the lawn returns and we're going to be inviting all the kids from boom and families from our church and it's just going to be a great time august 13th seven o'clock everything starts uh, we'll have some outdoor games we'll have some food popcorn some um, funnel cakes it's just going to be a good time so bring your family bring a chair blanket whatever pray that doesn't rain i know it rains all the time around here nowadays but and we will have a great night on the lawn, August 13th, Friday night, seven o'clock it starts, around 8.20, 8.25, we will begin the movie, and we'll tell you what the movie is when we get closer, but uh, love to see you out August 13th. Watch these additional announcements, and then we'll jump in to one more week of our series called A Beautiful Resistance. This week again is on prayer. So watch these, and then we'll jump into the message. River Church, what's going on? Welcome, welcome, welcome to our River Franklin Park online worship experience. So glad you've been with us. I'm Pastor Mark Helsel. If you don't know, welcome. Glad you're here. Thanks for joining us for this message today. And we, uh, during this message today, as you can see behind me, there's a beautiful church behind me. This is Saints John and Paul Church, just up the road from the river. And the, this church and our church has this very interesting history, which I can't go into um, 
a whole lot, but just to say this, that the church, if you come to our physical campus just down the road a couple miles, this church actually built our building. And so uh, we've had this connection with them and, and asked them if we could come out here and, and film today this message. And they said yes. And so here we are and here you are. So, hey, would you do me a favor? Would you like, subscribe, whatever is appropriate to do to share this with somebody? Uh, we are going through our summer in the Sermon on the Mount. Our summer series is completely in the Sermon on the Mount. We're calling it a beautiful resistance, Jesus and the Sermon on the Mount. And we're learning uh, how to live this beautiful resistance, this kingdom of God living in contrast to the kingdom of the world, to resist the ways of the world and to follow after the ways of Jesus. So glad you've been with us. So watch this and we'll jump into our message for today. One of the professors I got to study under was a guy named Kenneth Bailey, an amazing biblical scholar, historian, uh, lived in the Middle East for many, many years. Just an amazing, like, it's, he's one of those professors when, when you, uh, you get to study under him, your head's just like, pfft. it's just exploding when they're talking. Just an amazing time with him. He wrote a book called Jesus Through Middle Eastern Eyes, one of my favorite uh, books. And in it, he tells a story of being invited right after the fall of the Soviet Union to go in and speak to students about faith and religion. Now, these students were mainly 25 to 35 years old. And so all of their education had been in a communist system. And he asked one uh, of these people, because they had actually, all of them, had come to faith in Christ. And so he asked one of the young women how she came to faith. And he said this, was there a church in your village? He said, no, the communists closed all of them, she replied. Did some saintly grandmother instruct you in the ways of God? No, all the members of my family were atheists. Did you have a secret home Bible study or was there an underground church in your area? No, none of that came the answer. So what happened, he said. How did you come to faith in Christ? And this is what she said. At funerals, we were allowed to recite the Lord's Prayer. As a young child, I heard those strange words and had no idea who we were talking to, what the words meant, where they came from, or why we were reciting them. When freedom came at last, I had the opportunity to search for the meaning. When you are in total darkness, the tiniest point of light is very bright. For me, the Lord's prayer was that point of light. By the time I found its meaning, I was a Christian. So we are in week two of a mini series within this series, Beautiful Resistance, on prayer. And we're looking today at the Lord's Prayer, that beloved prayer that is said daily all over the world. So we're going to dive in. I hope you're ready for this and diving into the Lord's Prayer. Last week we looked at Jesus talking to us kind of about how to go about what we pray. This is really the heart of what we should pray. 
Not, not like we have to say the Lord's Prayer word for word for word, but at the heart of the things that the Lord's Prayer is calling us to. Now, we do call it the Lord's Prayer, and, and the title of this sermon today is the beginning of that prayer, Our Father, which is going to be the main focus of what we look at today. But it is called the Lord's Prayer, but it's often also called the Disciples' Prayer. Because this is the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples or the pattern by which they should pray that he taught his disciples. And so it really is the disciples prayer. It's what God has given to those who desire to be disciples of Jesus Christ, who want to follow after Jesus Christ, how their life should be shaped by prayer. And for our purposes, we're gonna call it the resistors prayer. These are how people who want to live this beautiful resistance, this kingdom of God life, this is how the Lord teaches us to pray. Pray. So if you want to call it the Lord's Prayer or the Disciples' Prayer or for our purposes in this series, the Resistors' Prayer. Now, I don't know about you, but we live in a culture where words are plentiful and cheap. Words are everywhere. There's, there's so much information in our culture and often a lack of wisdom. That's for another sermon. But in a culture where words are plentiful and cheap, Jesus in this prayer is going to give us a simple prayer of few words, but very valuable and sacred words. This prayer, this disciple's prayer, this Lord's prayer, this resistor's prayer is a pattern of prayer. It's a pattern of prayer to focus our hearts on the essentials, to focus our hearts on what really matters and shape us into being like Jesus. Did you get that? To shape us, you and me, into being like Jesus and helping us to live this beautiful resistance. I know what I'm seeking in my life, and I hope you are too, is to have less of you and more of Jesus. That's my hope for you. That's what I'm seeking in my life. I hope you are doing that too. Watch this video about the Sermon on the Mount, and we will come back and begin our teaching with our Father. You know, I didn't grow up in a church where we recited the Lord's Prayer. We didn't do it weekly. We didn't, we didn't do it hardly at all as a church. And so, yeah, I grew up around the Lord's Prayer, around the Disciples' Prayer, but I knew it was there. I knew it was there. I knew, I've, I'd heard it in my life, but I didn't know the value of it. It's kind of like this. Have you ever heard stories where somebody finds that upstairs in their attic, uh, tucked away in uh, a big huge crate or box is like a priceless or a very valuable uh, baseball card of a very famous baseball player or a comic book. And, and so they, they come across this and they realize, wow, this thing is com 
is really, really valuable. That was kind of how the Lord's Prayer was for me. It was just kind of something that was tucked up in the attic or the basement of my heart, but never really, never really knew the value of it and how much uh, there was for me there. Or worse yet, how about the stories of people that uh, they realize they have this really expensive comic or really expensive baseball card, but their mom threw them out when they when they cleaned out the uh, the basement or the attic. And some people, this is kind of what the Lord's Prayer is. Maybe they've thrown it out, and they've thrown out something that is so incredibly value. And one of the dangers with this prayer, as we read it today, one of the dangers with this prayer is our familiarity with it. That maybe we've said it a thousand times in our life and we can just spout the words off. And the familiarity that we have with it has cost us to lose the impact that it's meant to have in our lives. So let's turn there. Let's go to Matthew chapter six and continue in our study on the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter six, verse nine, after Jesus is done telling us things like pray in secret, don't pray to be seen so that people think you're awesome and, and you're all righteous. Don't do those things. He clearly tells us that's what the hypocrites do. He doesn't tell us, he tells us not to use big words and not to babble on like the pagans thinking that by all of our words that God will hear us, but just be simple, simple words. That's what we talked about last week. And then Jesus continues and he says this in verse nine, this then is how you should pray. I'm going to give you the heart of prayer. Jesus is saying, I'm going to give you a pattern for prayer. He says, this then is how you should pray. And the first word he says is our, our. And by the way, when he says this then is how you should pray, that you there is not singular, it's plural. It's plural in the Greek. And so he's saying, this is how you, y'all should pray, or for us, yins, this is how all yins should pray. And then he says, he begins with the word our hour. And so he gives us some clues about this prayer. Yes, this prayer is very personal, but this prayer is communal. This prayer is meant to be said together and lived out in a community of believers. It is communal and corporate and very personal, personal. That this prayer is supposed to help shape this community of faith this community of believers, that this is the way they live out the beautiful resistance as a community together. This is how that community comes together and keeps their mind centered on the essentials of what makes a true follower of Jesus Christ. And so that, that first word that we're so, we're so uh, familiar with and so easy to just skip over and just say, our, what's the big deal? But really, Jesus is calling us to be in a community of people. And then the second word is this, Father. Our Father. Now, this is so cool and so powerful if we really get a hold of what Jesus is really saying. So he calls us together as our, and then he says, Father. Now, the word there is actually an Aramaic word. This prayer is was originally said in Aramaic, then written in Greek, and then translated for us. But that word in Aramaic for father is Abba. Abba. Jesus is saying Abba. Now, this is really important. First of all, the Jews prayed prayers in Hebrew. That's all they prayed in was Hebrew. So it's very significant that Jesus, when he teaches his disciples how to pray, he teaches them Aramaic. Aramaic, not Hebrew. And he begins this with Abba. He doesn't begin it with, let's pray to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, a very Jewish prayer. He doesn't pray to the Redeemer of Israel. He prays to Abba, Abba, Father, which is a very personal term for Father. And, and also as one is praying to a superior, so it's kind of like your daddy, which is not really the best translation, but it's kind of like that. It's kind of like daddy. This is a very impersonal way to pray to God 
but still maintaining God's superiority over us. Just as your father is not your equal, your father is above you. And so this is the prayer that Jesus begins. Our father. Do you know that in the Middle East that Arabic is no longer spoken, but but that word, Abba, has remained. In fact, it is the first word that many, many people in the Middle East, that is the first word they learn to say. Kind of like learning to say daddy is Abba. And so Jesus begins this prayer with a deeply personal word, but also deeply inclusive in that it sets no one above anyone else. No, no uh, language, no nationality, no history. Like if he would have said the father or the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, well, there's a certain people that have a connection with that history. He just says, Abba, Father, God as our Father. Deeply personal and deeply inclusive is the beginning of this prayer. There's no barriers. There's no barriers here. All the barriers are broken down and we can approach God as Father. You can approach God as Abba, Father. Not the big guy upstairs, not very impersonal, all of those things that people refer to God as, but Father, Abba. And he brings it down to the level of everyone. The prostitute and the priest approach God the same way. Did you get that? The prostitute and the priest. Jesus brings it down to where everybody approaches God as Abba. And Jesus is moving everything here at the beginning of this prayer. He is moving everything everything and moving us towards the personal. God is moving our prayer life to the personal, to a personal interaction and communication with God. You know, sometimes we think we come to a church to do that. Sometimes we think that big prayers said in church, that's, that's, that's the way God wants us to pray. And there's nothing wrong with that. that that's, that's great. But God's moving us to the personal moving us to his heart, moving us towards Abba, moving us towards knowing God, the Father's heart for us. So Jesus continues, our Father in heaven. So yes, he is set apart from us. He is personal, but he's also, but he's also in heaven. And so God is with us, but he's yet also in heaven. And so it says, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Hallowed be your name. Hallowed is another way of just saying holy. Holy is the Lord God, our Father in heaven. Yes, the personal, the Abba to our hearts, but holy is your name. Hallowed is your name. God's name is holy and it's set apart he is the righteous one. He is the creator. He is the sustainer of all things. Hallowed be his name. Holy is his name. Now, there's something really cool in here that you miss because we read this in the English. We read this in the English, but the original Greek that this is written in translates a little different. And it's very significant, I think, to what we're talking about today as we study how to be beautiful resistors, how to live this beautiful resistance in the world. If you really translate, and you'll see it come up on the screen here, translate it out in the Greek. This is what it actually says. May it be made holy, your name. May it be made holy, your, your name, not holy is your name. So wait a minute, wait, wait a minute, Mark. Are you, what, what do you mean? Do you, are you saying that God's name needs to be made holy? Well, kind of. Yes, God is holy and nothing will ever change that. God is holy, the righteous one, the creator, the sustainer, and he is holy and nothing can change that. 
But this prayer is asking that we, in the way we make our lives, by the way we live our lives, by the way we represent Christ, about being a disciple, remember, disciples prayer, the way we live out our lives, it should make God's name holy wherever we go. You get that? That means the way we live our lives, the way you live your life, the way I live my life, should not defile the name of the Lord in front of others. When others see our lives, they should realize that God is holy by the way that we live out our faith. You get that? This is really powerful stuff. May it be made holy wherever I go. May your name be made holy, Lord. May I live in such a way that they would be pointed towards a holy living God. May it be made holy. May I live that beautiful resistance. May I live that beautiful holiness. May I live that beautiful life which brings glory to your name and, and proclaims your name as holy by the way that I live. Now, this is played out in the Old Testament in a very, very cool way. Isaiah chapter 6. So we're in Matthew chapter 6. Flip back to the Old Testament to Isaiah chapter 6. In Isaiah chapter 6, the prophet Isaiah is given a vision of God. It's one of the most well-known passages in the scripture. One of my favorites too. And Isaiah is given this beautiful picture of God. In Isaiah chapter 6, he sees God and sees God's throne. And everything around God's throne is saying, holy, holy, holy. Holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. And everything, all of creation is shouting out those words. God is holy. And when Isaiah is in the presence of that, you know what his response is? His response is this, woe is me. Basically, I'm toast. Woe is me. I'm toast because I'm unholy. I'm unclean. And I'm standing in the presence of the Holy One. I'm unclean. I'm not worthy to be here. I'm, I'm just, I'm done. And then he says, and I live amongst a people of unclean lips. His way of saying is, and I'm surrounded by people who are not holy and who are unclean. And so Isaiah sees who God is. He sees who who's his is. And then it says this, one of the seraphim, it's just kind of one of those crazy creatures that are around the, the throne of God. It says, flew to me with a live coal in its hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. So get this, there's this burning coal that comes from the altar of God, from God's provision to, to Isaiah. With it, he touched my mouth and he said, see, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Where did the atonement for his sin come from? Where did the forgiveness for his sin come from? What made him holy? What made Isaiah righteous? Was God's provision. Now we know this as Christ was given to us as the provision for our sins, cleanses us. So we're praying this prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed, holy is your name. Holy is your name, God. Keep that in the back of your mind. And then it says this, then I heard the voice of the Lord. So right after my sins are atoned for, he says, then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Okay, so you get this? Isaiah sees the holiness of God. His sins are atoned for. And then God's immediate words to him are, who's ready to go? Who's ready to go for us? Who's ready to go into a broken world and make my name holy? To bring people to repentance. Who's willing to go and share the good news of what God has done for you and will do for them? Who's ready to go? Who's ready to go? Who's ready to go and make my name holy? Who is willing to do that? And Isaiah answers, here I am. Send me. Here I am. Send me. See, when you're confronted with the holiness of God, God will immediately send you. Once your life has been transformed, 
then God sends you. And if you look at this Sermon on the Mount, if you look, if you look in this next prayer, the next part of the prayer, it goes like this. Your kingdom come, so send me, send me. This is all about you, God, not about me. It's about your kingdom come, your will be done. So send me out to do your will, to live out your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. We're praying for God's kingdom to come here on earth as it is in heaven. The beautiful resistance to come here. And I want to be a part of it. I want to be a part of it. And I'm willing to take that wherever I go. So we switch locations here for the last part of the video and we move to the back end of uh, the parking lot at St. John and Paul that overlooks this housing development to make this point. Jesus, or Isaiah says to us, he says, he says to God, send me, send me, send me to go and make your name holy. See, it doesn't matter. This, this, this prayer is is deeply personal, but it's more than personal. This prayer, when you pray it, it's deeply personal. Our Father, very, very personal. But it's so much more than personal when you say, uh, your will be done, your kingdom come. Well, where are you going to do that? You take it here. You, you take it to your neighborhood. You, you take it to where you work, you take it to your family. That when you pray, thy will be done, your kingdom come, we are praying that Jesus will make it more than personal, more than just me, that he will expand his kingdom, that he will build his beautiful resistance way beyond me. And just like Isaiah, we say, send me, God, send me to do that. So Jesus makes it more than personal. And then it comes back at the end of the prayer to being personal once again. We say, give us our daily bread. We, we focus in on what are the essentials that I need. Okay, God, give me our daily bread. And then he says, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. We need to learn to be great, great forgivers. We need, as God has forgiven us, we need to learn to forgive others and as they have forgiven me. In fact, I would probably say to you today that one of the greatest ways that we make God's name holy out there is to learn forgiveness and learn to forgive others it's, and, and to live a life where we know we've been forgiven and we live that life free of our sins and we live in this beautiful freedom of God through His forgiveness. And it's out here is where we truly live that out. And learning to forgive is so, so important. And then finally, he says, and deliver us from the evil one or from evil. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. And so God, give us the power. Deliver us, God, through your hand from evil. Keep my hands and my feet and my eyes from evil and deliver me from that. See, Jesus makes it very personal at the beginning of this prayer. Then he makes it more than perso personal. And he says, go, take my name, build my kingdom, do my will out there. And then at the end, he makes it a partnership. That God's in partnership with us, working in and through us, partnering with us, delivering us from evil, working in and through us. I want to close with a passage that's very familiar to us, that also might have lost its familiarity, but I think ties in so excellent with the Sermon on the Mount and with the Lord's Prayer. In Psalm 23, this is a psalm that is read often at funerals or different times needing comfort. I want you to notice something new for the first time. In Psalm 23, it says, The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. Give me my daily bread, right? God is my shepherd. He will give me my daily bread. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. 
Now listen to this. He guides me along the right path. Why? For his name's sake. Why does God lead me? Why does God lead me on right paths? For his name's sake. So that his name would be made holy. So that he would get the glory. So that his name would be proclaimed correctly and rightly out into the world. Are you walking that right path for his name's sake? Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. God will deliver me. Lord, deliver us from the evil one. I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Lord, forgive my debtors and forgive, forgive my debts. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Our Father, who art in heaven, and where I will dwell one day in your house forever, hallowed be your name. David is praying about God as his shepherd, and if you know Jesus, you know the good shepherd, the one who teaches us how to pray. So I hope prayer for you is deeply personal, deeply personal. But I hope, as Jesus taught us, that prayer is more than personal for you, more than personal. That prayer takes you there with the message of Jesus Christ. And I pray that you are enjoying this partnership with Jesus, with his spirit delivering you and giving you the power to live a godly life. Amen and amen. I hope you are too. So watch this video. <laughs> I just got a fly just flew in my chair. <laughs> so we'll do, we'll do a cutaway. Okay, pause there. Can you stop that? I gotta switch pages. Jesus Christ, who want to follow after Jesus Christ, how their life should be heaven, in heaven. Our fire, out. <laughs> start over. <laughs> to a group of mostly Whoops.